even on some of the old continental currency, it says that counterfeiting is uh, an, an offense punishable by death mm -hmm. on it because they knew that counterfeiting is theft from everybody. If you create new currency that has no work behind it to create it for it to come into existence, uh, then it gets its purchasing power by stealing it from all other units of currency. And so the Federal Reserve is just based on fraud, theft, and enslavement because they're buying U.S. treasuries, which you have to work in the future to pay the principal and the interest on. And they bought them by creating currency from nothing. And then where they spend it, and it usually gets spent into the financial system, uh, the people that are uh, benefiting from that wealth transfer that they cause don't even realize that, uh, that all of this wealth was stolen from somebody else. Hi, I want to welcome everybody to this video, and I've got Alan Hibbert with me once again. Alan, how are you doing? I'm great, Mike. Thanks. How are you? Good. So you've put together um, a bunch of uh, different uh, tweets and some articles and so on uh, about uh, the economy, <laughs> the government. <laughs> Show me what you got. Let's go over some of this. Yeah, sure. Well, first, I want to start with a tweet from Tim Draper. Um, he's got a section here on government math where he talks about the tax revenue, the budget, the debt, the national debt, and budget cuts. And these are really big numbers. It's hard to wrap your brain around it. So now let's remove eight zeros and pretend it's a household budget. This is much easier. So imagine okay. an, an annual family income of 21000 okay? Income of 21000 Right. But Let me stop you right here for just okay. a second. So Because I've been presenting this in this format, I think going all the way back to like 2005 where, but back then you didn't remove eight zeros. You removed like uh, six and then a decade later it was seven. <laughs> and now we're removing eight zeros to bring this down to where it, you can comprehend it as if this was your own family. Can you run your own family like this? It's hilarious, but but okay, now go ahead, start over. Now let's remove eight zeros and pretend it's a household budget. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah, so we'll remove eight zeros, soon it'll be nine, but anyways, let's pretend it's a household budget. Imagine an income of 21,000 a year, okay, but you're spending 38,000, so you're spending significantly more. So you're basically racking up debt on the credit card of $16,000 per year, right, with no end in sight, and the outstanding balance on your credit card is already close to $200,000, $200,000. And you're not With paying it down. With a $20,000 income, right? $20, yeah, you're not paying it down. You're increasing it year after year with no yeah. end in sight. And you get together and you say, you know what? We have to spend a little bit less. Let's do a family budget cut of $385. <laughs> uh, this is just, <clears throat> it, everything is out of control. Uh, and there's so many different factors that, like we were just talking earlier, uh, that are coming together right now. And we'll do a video on them in the future. But there are factors coming together over just the next couple of months that are going to change the trajectory of everything. Uh, so uh, um, I've, I've just never seen anything like this. And uh, so the government is out of control. It's crazy. We've got this Inflation Creation Act. Oh, that was re Inflation Reduction, right? Yeah. Inflation Reduction Act uh, that is supposed to reduce uh, inflation by creating currency and spending it. <laughs> so, okay, let's, let's move on. Okay. So the next, thing I, next thing I wanted to show was on the same theme. Um, this is an interview that uh, Stanley Druckenmiller did where he did not speak so highly of Janet Yellen. In fact, quite the opposite. He spoke lowly of her arguing that she might be um, the the worst treasury secretary in the history of the position. If I literally think if you go back to Alexander Hamilton, it was the biggest blunder in the history of the treasury. I have no idea why she has not been called out on this. She has no right to still be in that job. Yeah, you know, I watched that video and he is just, he nailed it right on the head. I highly recommend everybody, you know, search around for this Drunken Miller video. 
and uh, and give it a watch. It's only two minutes long and it's worth your time. Yeah, definitely. Um, and there's also, you know, an article that goes with this, um, the biggest blunder in treasury history. And I wanted to pull out a couple quotes from it. The first one is, <clears throat> is this, Janet Yellen, I guess because of a political myopia or whatever, was issuing two-year, two-year um, treasury bonds at 15 basis points when she could have issued 10 years at 70 basis points or 30 years at 180 basis points, he said. I literally think if you go back to Alexander Hamilton, it is the biggest blunder in the history of the treasury. I have no idea why she has not been called out on this. She has no right to still be in that job. Uh, absolutely true. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. And, you know, um, the... Two years that she was issuing back when uh, the interest rates were at the lowest in like the last 90 years. I mean, you got to go back to the Great Depression to find interest rates this low uh, that, uh, that we had just a couple of years ago. And now it's two years later and these have to be uh, uh, basically we've got to do it's like refinancing your house. You got to refinance. But instead of it uh, doing it. When the Fed funds rate is at one tenth of one percent, the Fed front funds rate is now uh, five point three three. <laughs> so, how many times higher is that? One tenth of one percent to five point three three. Uh, Fifty three times. <laughs> <laughs> you know. it's, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And so, sure. okay. Yeah. Fifty times the rate. So she yeah. Has no she has no right to be in this job, but you know, uh, inflation is transitory and we need two weeks to flatten the curve. Oh, wait a minute. That part was said by somebody. Else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, this word right here, uh, political, I think political is the, the operative word here. It's not yeah, necessarily, sure. um, you know, prudent or, or in the public good. So, um, anyways, there, there is, there is one thing I wanted to touch on here. There's an article why Janet Yellen isn't worried about the $33 trillion national debt. Okay. And, and there's a good quote from in here. She says, the statistic or metric that I look at most, most often to judge our fiscal course is net interest as a share of GDP. Okay. So, and then she says, and even with the, the rise we have seen in interest rates, that remains at a very reasonable level. Okay, so net interest as a share of GDP. So let's look at those two things and see what the trajectory is like. It, this is interest yeah. payments. It's exploding. It's absolutely exploding lately. And I know, Mike, that you wanted to pull this up on your screen so you can talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, so uh, Dan, if you could share my screen, um, this is the... Uh, Federal government current expenditures interest payments. So just the interest payments broken, broken out. And you can see here that it started to explode in 2021, but we actually didn't start raising the uh, interest rates until it would be second quarter of 2022 when, when you, because it was March was the first of 2022 was the first interest rate rise. And then it really takes off and starts going vertical. And we're getting up to where it's uh, going to be a trillion dollars a year here of interest on the national debt. But um, I wanted to look at this in a little bit more depth. And she's talking about as a percentage of gross domestic product. So I took the last chart, divided it by GDP. And this makes it look like she's right, that this isn't too bad, that this is manageable. Because look at where we were back here in the 80s. But then I dug a little bit deeper. I knew we were going to be talking about this. I didn't know, uh, you know, all of the quotes and everything else. I knew we were just going to be talking about interest payments as a percent a percentage of GDP. That was what the topic was after watching Stanley Drunkenmiller. Uh, and so why was this high? Uh, it starts off here in Q3 of 77 is when it starts like going vertical. And uh, it, it doesn't finish rising until 85, 
but it doesn't, you know, it, it makes this peak from 82 to 86, actually the end of 81. So from, from the end of 81 until 1996, I'm sorry, and it goes back down. So that's a 15 year period where interest was taking a very large percentage of the economy. So what was going on back then? Well, in 77, when it started rising, the national debt was only 33% of one third the size of the economy. And then it went down to 31% by 1981. So remember that in 1981 is when we started to grow the debt quicker than the economy. When this is descending, we're always going deeper into debt, but what's happening here is the economy is growing faster than uh, how the economy is growing faster than the politicians can spend it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still going deeper in debt, but they're just not able to keep up uh, their level of spending to uh, make us deeper in debt as a percentage of our income. And so here, uh, and I want to point out, this is during the Reagan era, and uh, you know the Republicans are always arguing for smaller government, less taxes, uh, uh, and here is where the expenditures of, uh, and then we went after Reagan, it was uh, Bush Sr., and uh, so this huge increase of, you know, it's, it's not a party thing, it's a political thing coupled with demographics age groups and so on. Uh, and But this goes level to 1996 and then starts to fall. So it's in 1996 that we start growing the economy faster than the politicians can spend it again. So the, the economy is growing faster than the debt. So let's go back to this chart and see what's happening. In 77, this exploded. There's one other thing that was happening in 77. Uh, interest rates, 1977, 76, 77, interest rates start to go way up from under 5% to 19.85% uh, here, and they peak in 1980. The end of 1980 is when it peaks, and then they fall dramatically from 80 and all the way down into, uh, you know, you'll see when I go back to that interest as a percentage of GDP, it starts to rise in this area, but it doesn't fall. It plateaus from 81 all the way to 96. It plateaus and then starts falling. So, uh, and here is the graph I'm talking about. So when interest rates started to rise from uh, 77, to Q4 of 81, I believe it was, that's where interest rates peaked. And this is just, re so all of the debt that was refinanced during this interest rate rise, and while interest rates were fairly high, and then growing the amount of debt uh, faster than the GDP, which is what is happening right now, kept us at these very high levels where interest was a huge burden all the way to 1996, where interest rates during this period of time were falling precipitously. I mean, it was, uh, it, it was huge, the amount that the interest rates fell from uh, 22% in 1980 down to 1993 and four here, we're talking about 2.85%. So it fell by almost 20% <laughs> from 22 point something, 22%. So it fell 19% basically out of 22. <laughs> but the, the debt as a percentage of GDP haunted us for another 15 years because we were growing the national debt, the, the amount that we're paying on, even though the interest was going down, the debt was going up faster than the economy was going. The politicians were figuring out a way to spend it faster than the economy could grow. And so um, that it, you know, now we're doing these rate increases. This is, you know, basically say it call that if you if you say this is 
and this is 30%, that's one, it used to be one quarter. It's four times larger now. The debt to GDP is four times larger. And we're going through these rate rises. The rate rises, you know, in 77 through 81 was with the debt to GDP down here as practically nothing. The economy was big. The politicians uh, hadn't been able to keep up their spending with the growth of the economy. But you look at what is happening now, and we just passed this uh, Inflation Creation Act. And, uh, and, and now, when the next crisis happens, which I feel is just right around the corner, and we're going to make a video on this in the future because of all the factors that are converging to become the trigger. This should happen early next year to mid next year. We should see a crisis unfold. And uh, it's going to start from these levels. And then the government is going to, there, there, you can see that what the government and the Federal Reserve does to save us, they create currency, they drop rates to zero, they start buying up uh, all of our future taxation, uh, buying up US treasuries and our future mortgage payments, buying up more mortgage backed securities. Uh, and the federal government comes up with all these emergency spending maneuvers and sends out checks to everybody and uh, uh, all of that. So uh, I believe <laughs> that you can't um, fix this through the methods that we know that the Federal Reserve and the government are going to do. They, we know what their act is. We know uh, what their modus operandi is. And so I'm going to turn this back over to you now. Uh, so, yeah, I I do want to pick up with the chart you were just showing, and I have a couple more quick quotes. Oh. Um, one from Druckenmiller and one from Yellen. Uh, and so if we just look at this chart of interest payments to GDP, uh, we're about three and a half percent right now. So keep that in mind, three and a half percent. So when was the last time that was updated? That was probably uh, Q2. What does it say? Q3. Uh, Q3 oh, okay. of this year. So actually oh, pretty yeah. recent. Just, so it's pretty recent. Yeah. So three and a half percent. So Druckenmiller in that in that interview, he said, when the debt rolls over by 2033, so 10 years from now, interest expense is going to be four and a half percent of GDP if rates are where they are now. By 2043, so 20 years, it sounds like a long time, but it's really not. Interest this is that 15 year delay that I'm talking about, where uh, if you keep on spending into this, we end up with this as a burden for years and years and years to come. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. So so in 20 years, which really isn't that long, it's, it's one generation, interest expense as a percentage of GDP will be 7%. So hang on, 7%. If we look at this chart, the the, the top of it here is 5%. We, we've never been at 7% before, only right. 5%. And this chart only goes back to about 1947, but I'm pretty sure may, maybe during uh, World War II, maybe for like a year or two. But it's if it happened, it certainly wasn't for a long period of time. Um, so yeah, this is, this is going to be record breaking by a lot. And again, with no end in sight, and that 7% of GDP is over a hundred percent of, of discretionary spending, 144% of all discretionary spending. So we, we can't afford that. Right. Yeah. I think in that, um, that video, uh, he did say that, uh, that, uh, they're telling us that there won't be any, um, uh, budget cuts for the uh, the mandatory the, the social programs that are part of the mandatory spending and yeah. which is pretty much and he says they're lying to you it's impossible <laughs> 144% doesn't if if you've got mandatory spending uh, that 44% has to come out of the mandatory they've got they've got to uh, yeah. yeah so but we got so far back to the first <laughs> tweet $385 <laughs> when you're, you know, 200 grand in the hole and, and growing at 16 grand a year. You, you can't you can't cut $400 and expect that to make a difference. Yet that's where we are. That's what we're doing. And, right. and, just continue and that's it, what we're um, going to continue doing. I mean, yeah. OK. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I do want to uh, present a couple quotes from Janet Yellen. She did sort of address this. Um, but first, just one more um, voice of reason, maybe. Some critics have gone a step further in their warnings about the potential impact of an increasingly indebted U.S. government, 
Mark Spitznagel, founder of the hedge fund Uni Universa Investments, told Fortune in August that we're living through the greatest credit bubble in human history. We've heard people call it this before. It's, it's really hard to say that that's wrong. It is absolutely the greatest credit bubble in human history. And he said, we've never seen anything like this level of total debt and leverage in the system. It's an experiment. You know, it's the first time it's happened. We do know that credit bubbles have to pop. We don't know when, but we know that they have to. So he's saying, he's saying it's a mathematical certainty. We know it has to pop. It's only a matter of time. We can't predict when, but we know the future gets here eventually. The future gets here eventually. We can't hide from it. However, we get people, we get people in charge, people running the show that seem to be oblivious of the future. They only focus on the present moment. And we've got two quotes from Janet Yellen that summarize that. Yellen did admit on Monday that moving forward, the federal government will need to, quote unquote, make sure to keep deficits under control. Otherwise, the national debt could become an issue maybe someday <laughs> eventually. I mean, <laughs> this is absurd. And, and she said something very similar. Um, she added, uh, uh, certainly greater deficit reduction is possible. The president has proposed a series of measures that would reduce our deficits over time while investing in the economy. And this is something we need to do going forward. It, this is such a this is such a non-answer. It's like, oh, someone else, in this case, it's the president, right? But no matter who gives yeah. the, no matter which politician gives these quotes, they're always saying, oh, someone else is going to do this. Someone else in the future, maybe someday. Look, I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm not too optimistic that this is going to end well. I don't have a lot of faith in our leadership, regardless of political party. That's just my take. Right, right. Uh, you know, uh, whenever you take uh, when when they do deficit spending or when they do direct taxation, and there's a great video from uh, Milton Friedman on this that we'll cover some other time, uh, but basically you end up paying for it. You either, if they do deficit spending and they print the currency to cover it, uh, then uh, you either pay for it through borrowing or inflation, one or the other. It's got to be paid back. Everybody pays for this. And so they're taking that out of the economy they're running it through the system of all of these blood sucking bureaucrats that do not produce anything that you would rightfully want to, uh, and you'd have to be insane out of your mind to uh, choose the thing. I mean, next time you are sitting in traffic going nowhere and you're late for something, think about the service you're buying from the US government because that's what you're doing. You're paying them for this service. Uh, and it's, it's, they, it's very, very inefficient. So taking any currency out of the real economy and you do that, whether you're actually doing it through taxation or deficit spending or borrowing, it all ends up coming out of the real economy that entrepreneurs, business owners are uh, creating. Uh, and so uh, it, the government spending can't be an answer or the USSR would have worked. Yes, exactly. And uh, so when I think about you know, you know what's going on here. It's it's tempting to think, oh, that's a problem for the government to deal with. I'm just going to run my own personal life, and and they can deal with their own problem. But the reality is, the government problem is our problem. Like you and I, and every taxpayer, we're the ones who are going to pay for that. Like you said, either through taxes or through inflation. And of course, it'll be our right. children and grandchildren, and so on. So, right. and it's not only paying the the inefficient service that they provide, but it's also in between that inefficient service and you there's a whole bunch of people that have to get paid in government that once they take it from you, they think it's theirs and they get to uh, decide that they're going to send some of it to this country for, for aid or for arms or that they're going to uh, give it to this group of people because they're not as well off as you are. Well, the people that are well off, most of them did it through a bunch of hard work. Uh, and the, uh, the people that are, you know, <clears throat> I live in a, uh, uh, a touristy area of Puerto Rico, but there are, uh, there's government housing just a couple miles down the street. And, you know, I <laughs> go to the grocery store and I see people buying two, $300 worth of groceries. They slide a card through, and, which is a snap card. And then they give the, uh, the uh, girl at the checkout counter uh, a $5 bill and get change back for the items that SNAP doesn't cover. 
<laughs> and so they're living in free housing. Uh, and then they have a cash job on the side. All these people do something for cash on the side. That uh, here it's it's very popular to get coupons, they call it, which is the uh, same thing as food stamps or the SNAP program. And then you get whatever you can out of the government. And they think that it's the government giving it to them because that's the way the politicians always sound so magnanimous. Vote for me and I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you that. <laughs> the politician has to hold a gun to somebody else's head and extract that wealth out of them. And that person was uh, creating a product or service efficiently and then selling it directly to the public without the chain of bureaucracy in the middle. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to end with something in the spirit of uh, being generous, not just being generous with other people's money, but being generous with, with what we ourselves can give to other people. It is a meme of the day. These kids think they're getting candy tonight when I'm really passing out 15 hours of Ron Paul explaining why we need to audit the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except uh, that should say end the Fed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Ron Paul also wants to end the Fed. I agree. Uh, it, it is a, um, you know, in, when the United States started, uh, even on some of the old continental currency, it says that counterfeiting is uh, an, an offense punishable by death mm -hmm. on it because they knew that counterfeiting is theft from everybody. If you create new currency that has no work behind it to create it for it to come into existence, uh, then it gets its purchasing power by stealing it from all other units of currency. And so the Federal Reserve is just based on fraud, theft, and enslavement because they're buying U.S. treasuries, which you have to work in the future to pay the principal and the interest on. And they bought them by creating currency from nothing. And then where they spend it, and it usually gets spent into the financial system, uh, the people that are uh, benefiting from that wealth transfer that they cause don't even realize that uh, that all of this wealth was stolen from somebody else. And so we, we live under this very evil, corrupt uh, financial system. And I do want to encourage, if, if people want to understand this part of it better, go to GGSR 21 and read chapter four of the book. Alan and I put a lot of work into trying to explain how all of this works and where all of the actual purchasing power comes from. It comes from stealing it from you, whether it's the government stealing it from you directly or whether it's the banking system or the Federal Reserve creating new currency that didn't exist before. You're the one footing the bill. So anything else you wanted to cover, Alan, or is that it? That's, that's it, Mike. Okay, Thanks. I want to thank everybody for watching. Thank you, Alan, and we'll see you all next time. Smash that like and subscribe. See you later. Thanks for watching, but this is by no means the whole story. If you want the full story, including my free online-only chapters and companion videos, there's a wealth of information at ggsr21.com. Thanks.